On today's show, Leafs reporter David Alter swings by to break down the latest from Leafs practice after some harsh remarks from Sheldon Keefe. We'll also tee up this weekend's back-to-back. So we'll get into all that more on today's edition of the Lockdown Leafs podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, a daily Maple Leafs centric podcast hosted by myself, Mike DiStefano, and my co-host, Dave Morissuti. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. All right, welcome into the show, and uh, we're going to be joined today by Leafs reporter from the Hockey News and Sports Illustrated. You probably know him if you're uh, a diehard Leaf fan. It's our guy, David Alter. What's going on, Dave? Thank you for joining us today. Great to be here, Mike and David. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. I I really wanted to get somebody such as yourself who covers the team and is around the team uh, to come and just kind of tell us, like, what the temperature is like in the room after this really the last few games here, but specifically after that Ottawa game, it, it seems like things might be getting to a little bit of a boiling point. So, you know, what is the temperature like right now with the Maple Leafs? It's a little tense. I mean, they're going into 13 games now where they're still kind of trying to find their identity. And you could argue that they really haven't put forth a full 60 minute defensive effort. All their wins seem to be these uh, come from behind victories or these spurts of offense that cover up some mistakes or maybe some other things. But then you have a couple of games where they were on the road and on the road, they looked really good. Like they played really well against Dallas and Nashville. They lost, but they looked really good in that. And there's been, you know, things here and there where it looks like sometimes they round the corner, but then they're home and they're here. And uh, it just doesn't look very good right now. And the injuries don't help. And uh, the injuries are all on the back end. And so because of that, uh, it's pretty tense now. There's just uh, an impatience kind of growing for a lot of these newcomers to kind of gel and fit into what's being expected of them from a defensive standpoint. And we just really haven't seen that yet. And then when you're expecting offense from some of the newcomers, that's not coming either. It's coming from a lot of the usual suspects. So uh, there's a lot to kind of figure out and you just wonder how long is it going to take? That's really the vibe. I think a lot of players are kind of figuring out, okay, when, when's the switch going to flip here? And it just hasn't yet. Well, I think the the player who's gotten the most heat as of late has been John Klingberg. And Sheldon Keefe was pretty visceral last night calling him out specifically, um, basically just saying we, we need to protect him. Like he's he's not doing well enough here. We we gotta protect him somehow. Um, like what how how do they do that? How do they protect John Klingberg? And and do you think that like his game is salvageable right now? Like what where are you at with John Klingberg? Yeah, I mean, there's been times it's looked really bad. Like, like that that last game was probably the worst one of the season. Like when, yeah. when the play is in, in back, he looks like he's out of position. And when he's trying to recover, you know, he's kind of doing one of those like jabs where he's like, there's nowhere close to the puck. And, and you just kind of know it just started from a very bad place. And guys are trying to come in and support. But because of that, they kind of get out of position. And it's been a long learning curve for him. And so I don't know if it's one of those things where he needs to go out with the skills people, which the Leafs have plenty of them. I've talked to other defensemen and players who utilize that, go out early and do one-on-one work with certain people, whether it's skating or whatever. You know, I usually get to the arena pretty early. I don't really see him doing much of that. Although today he was out on the ice a bit earlier than, than others. So maybe the message is starting to kind of go through here. But uh, I mean, in terms of protecting him, what it looks like it's going to be is seventh defenseman. And that's what like the, the Eric Gustafson role last year, where you're playing like five to seven yeah. minutes and, uh, and barely kind of getting in there and just using your offensive things. And then, you know, 
I, I guess if, if if he was confident on the power play, maybe it translates to defense, but it really shouldn't – like this is an NHL player. It really shouldn't come down to that. So how much of the struggles do you think is confidence, though? Like this this guy had 50 points like three years ago. Like he was a 50-point yeah. defenseman. He was considered widely as like a, a, a top pair guy by some, but certainly a top four guy. And now all of a sudden he just doesn't have it where it's like this guy's – almost not playable where we got to have him as a seventh defenseman with strictly ozone starts and some power play time. I would argue a lot is riding on the John Klingberg experiment for a number of reasons. The things you mentioned, which is that, you know, I'll never begrudge any player for being honest about themselves. We love it as reporters and, and they like that, but you know, right when he signed, he's like, I know my defensive game needs to improve. And uh, he was pretty honest about it and we like that but now it's starting to kind of get old and it's stuff that he was saying before and before and it's a lot of talk and not action and so right. there's that not only that but the Leafs have had a good reputation at least under Dubis and with some of the other dev staff of being able to repair guys like the best you ever saw of Alex Galchenyuk over the last four or five years was when he was with the Maple Leafs and they got him up to the second line and, yeah. and it didn't Not in end the last well. 48 hours. We can definitely mm. say that. Okay, let's let's forget <laughs> the video and all that stuff yeah. that's come out. But I'm talking about 2021 when yeah. he was at his lowest at that point, and the Leafs brought him in. And you know, they had this reputation of being able to fix players, like getting them in, retooling their game. Maybe that's what they need to do with Klingberg, which is where they don't play him. He's on the active roster if they can swing it. And they just spend a couple of weeks just trying to rebuild him because it doesn't seem like he's ever really had that. And if the Leafs don't make this a success by trying to rebuild him and, and his career might be finished in the NHL, that would be one. And second, it would really be damning for the Leafs prospective, you know, rebuild type of go get these type of players and see if you can fix them under the cap. Like they've been able to, kind of do a pretty good job of in years past. So mm. uh, it, it's it's tough. It, it really is. I think a lot is riding to kind of make this work somehow from a cap standpoint, from the fact that every year it's diminishing returns. Like it went from Dallas deciding, yeah, you're good, but we're not going to sign you. Clearly they saw something that they didn't want to go long-term in them. And then it just got worse with Anaheim, worse with Minnesota. And now it's like... Uh, you know, it's just been a free been. fall. You don't know like, where don't it's going to go. Yeah, like I don't know if you saw either of you guys saw Dom Lecision's tweet, uh, just like charting his defensive play and offensive play. Defensively, he's fallen off a cliff. He's like a minus yeah. six defensive rating. But even offensively, like he's a, a minus one. Like I was at that game last night. The amount of times that the crowd's yelling shoot to this guy, like he's supposed to be an offense. And this is why I think part part of it is confidence. Because he is somebody who, prior to um, you know becoming the defensive liability he's became, like he was known as an offensive defenseman, someone who could shoot the puck, and that's who he's supposed to come in here for. The reason why he's on the power play over Riley is because they wanted a guy who could shoot the puck, right? But yeah. he's not doing that either. And, and I wonder if that's also just sheer confidence. And, and they got to figure out a way to get his his head back in the game. Yeah, well, they got to figure out something soon here because. Uh, it's a one-year deal. It's not a long, long-term yeah. thing, but there's a lot riding on this season with so many one-year type guys. And with John Klingberg, it's really the first big Brad Tree living defensive pickup, really, in, in terms of how you're going to remake this. And so he saw something that the Leafs don't have, and you could argue that offensively there was that potential. But I don't know if it was the summer, if it was him, or, or if playing in the Toronto market. We talked to him today. He didn't really seem to think that was much of anything. But, um, yeah, it, it's one of these things where maybe the seventh defenseman might make sense, and then if you can get some scoring there, it goes. He needs a goal. I think if a goal happens, that might help things. But he's just so open and honest, which we love, about just the struggles that he's gone through. And so he's trying not to do too much, but then he's not scoring. And then it's like he's not doing enough. So, like, what are you bringing to the team? So yeah. it's it, it it's really just a void right now. And it's there's an exclamation mark on it right now because of who the Leafs were missing in the lineup, too. 
but here the question I have is how patient can you be throughout this, right? Like the Leafs, in a way, like they're cap strapped with this deal. They don't exactly have a lot of depth. They can't just have him sitting in the press box, right? They need him to play and to be good. Like, how much patience can they have right now? I think that if it continues to go the way it goes, they may have no choice but to do that thing I suggested and give them a week, work with skill staff, and try to really take a breather and figure out what it is that you're doing wrong and how you can correct it. Or, or, or maybe it's it's the system. Uh, it's a system thing. Mark Giordano brought up a really good point today too that he didn't think it was just on Klingberg that he's just kind of not a symptom of it, but one of these things where in past years the leaf system is set up in such a way that if someone does jump up, that there is that support. And with so many new guys here, they're just not in that same fluidity of being able to do that. And so Klingberg, because he's the big new guy there, kind of really that just gets pushed up to the forefront because, and it's true, Mark Giordano was pretty bad in that game too, but we're, we're yeah. focusing on Klingberg because he's new and he's had some of these other games before. And he's just, you know, he's, he's the second worst on the team right now at minus eight, if you believe a lot in that stat, but he was on the ice for four, even strength goals against and that wasn't good. No, that was tough. Um, yeah. You know, a big reason why obviously he's had to play so much though is, is because of the injuries, as you noted with, Lilligren and uh, obviously Connor Timmons at preseason and Jake McCabe. How much of that seven and and eleven hinders on on Jake McCabe? I guess probably all of it. I would assume. Um, yeah. But what's did you get an update from uh, practice today regarding his status this weekend? Well, I mean they're gonna they're gonna see, but based on everything, it looks like Jake McCabe will be in the lineup, and it looks like it'll be eleven and seven with Ryan Reeves being the guy who's out because we haven't seen. Ryan Reeves kind of stay out for as long as he did. Uh, the team had some sort of mandatory NHL meeting that they all had to attend. So they had to wrap things up pretty quickly with media availability and everything. And Ryan Reeves was still out there like long past into that. So my, my feeling is based on that, which we haven't seen some of the other deployment too. the fact that Ryan Reeves is actually the worst on the team at minus nine right now and uh, has been very limited in the minutes, not the last game, but the one before against Tampa and the type of opponent that's coming in, that I think they just there's a focus on team defense, and 11-7 and seven is going to be that way. And uh, it also helps Jake McCabe kind of get settled in here too because he was not setting the world on fire with his defensive play before his injury either. No. So, so there's a lot that benefits the 11-7 and seven formation there. Uh, and then you can just kind of put Klingberg into those offensive spots, hope he gets the goal, and then the switch just flips, knowing that if he's just not feeling it, there's six other defensemen who are capable, and that puts less pressure on him to perform. Because remember, the Leafs have had so many games where they've been down to five, and he's been one of the five. And yeah. with the way he's playing, that's probably weighing on him as well. Yeah, playing 25 minutes a night. It's not ideal. Yeah. <laughs> not ideal right. for uh, for this group. I We'll get back to our chat with David Alter in just a moment, but first, I do want to tell you about one of our show sponsors, and that's Parkview Advance. As a business owner, you realize that there are times when receivables might fall behind, but that doesn't mean you need to fall behind on vendor payments, payroll, or rent. For more than 25 years, Parkview Advance has helped businesses secure working capital from 5000 to $1.5 million. Parkview Advance can improve your working capital in as little as 24 hours. It's a much easier process than you might imagine. We invite the many entrepreneurs that are locked on NHL fans to learn more by calling us at 203-675-0071 or go to parkviewadvance.com. If your business is working capital, call Parkview Advance today. Parkview Advance, helping businesses with their working capital. Go to parkviewadvance.com. Today's show is also brought to you by Collective. If you run a solo small business, you're an army of one, but you still need a CPA, bookkeeper, separate payroll solution, and more, let Collective take care of the paperwork while you take care of the business. Collective is the number one financial solution for freelancers, contractors, and self-employed entrepreneurs that lets you focus on your passion, not your paperwork. 
Let Collective handle all the paperwork you dread, like corporate formation and compliance, taxes, bookkeeping, accounting, and even payroll. The best part, it's a fraction of the cost of a CPA. Collective knows that if your business of one makes over 80 grand a year, you will find the most value for their services. Join the thousands of solopreneurs who have saved an average of $10,000 per year on taxes with their structure. Right now, Collective is offering a one-month free trial and no onboarding fee when you go to collective.com slash locked on NHL and tell them that locked on NHL sent you. That's a $550 value for free when you go to collective.com slash locked on NHL and tell them that locked on NHL sent you. That's collective.com slash locked on NHL and we sent you. In conversation with David Alter of the Hockey News and Sports Illustrated. Um, I did see that, uh, you know, your colleague, our colleague now, actually, uh, Nick Barden wrote today, uh, on, uh, the website that Matt Dumba apparently had some interest in coming to Toronto and there's mutual interest on both sides. Um, you think if given a do over, would Brad Trilliving have went the Dumba route over the Klingberg route? I think he would have tried to get both. Like, I think that's what it really came down to is because they're kind of different in that regard. Like Dumba obviously plays with a bit more of an edge, even though he can play up in the lineup. But I, I think Tree Living's made it pretty clear that he wants to kind of not remake the defense, but he talked about liking bigger defensemen and the Leafs really outside of Klingberg really brought the same kind of cast and characters back with the exception of, you know, Simone Benoit has played a couple of games here. And he's a, a free agent late pickup, but not yeah. certainly someone you projected for your, your top six in terms of remaking the D. So maybe I, I Brad Tree Living to me doesn't strike me as a type that's going to react to 13 games, even if one guy is kind of struggling. Um, I think what what's really unfortunate for Leafs right now is that every new player right now is struggling for the Maple Leafs with the exception of maybe Noah Gregor. And even now you could say he was kind of struggling because that fourth line's been struggling. Yeah. So so I don't know. I, I maybe he would do it over, but certainly Matt Dumba, you can see the attributes that he brings uh that the Leafs would have liked. And for what Arizona got him for, it seemed like it was somewhat doable, but the Leafs are just pressed up against the cap and it came down to the fact that Klingberg is who they got. Signed for less 3. than 9. Yeah. But that's why I think it was after. Like mm. I, I think it was after everything because I think they, I think there was a clear recognition that they needed an offensive defenseman and someone that they can buy low on. Which I think going in, I think a lot of people thought, given the Leafs' reputation of rebuilding guys, you know, the ceiling is very high for a type of player the Leafs haven't really had. Morgan Riley's been the big source of their offense on on defense, and and uh, they haven't really had anyone that you're kind of like boom offensive defenseman. Like, um, I can't even remember the last time. Like, the last – I go way back, but Brian Burrard pre-eye injury might have been the best offensive defenseman the Leafs have had in the last, like, 20 years. Uh, Caberle. I mean, Caberle put up a lot of points. Caberle was a good he, puck mover, but, like – He didn't have the shot. Like, he wasn't the one yeah. shooting the puck. He was, like, the distributor in a lot of ways, I would that's say. That's what I mean. I, I That's what I mean. Like, someone who's, like – who can some... kind of – Play two hundred foot. Want some like, salt and, in the wound too? Why yeah. didn't they just keep Gustafson? Well, like, yeah, the Gu Gustafson. You know what? It's unfortunate. I really he's got want nine to see points. It. He's got nine points right now, and in, in where the Rangers are with the Rangers. Rangers. Yeah, look, but like Eric Gustafson, unfortunately, his tenure was just interrupted by um, uh, like um, an incident that happened with his daughter where they found that she was allergic to gluten. So he had to leave the team for a while. And then when he came back, they actually did, they actually skated where they were going to put him on PP one ahead of Morgan Riley for a game. Uh, and then in the warm up, he got hurt. And that's where remember the story where Luke Shen had to come off the bus and uh, right. not warm up and play. And then after that, it was just kind of like, you never really got to see what Eric Gustafson's potential is. And now he's, you know, the, the Rangers got a really good find in him. But, um, yeah, it's too bad. Uh, <laughs> everything's working out for the Rangers, the Canucks. Uh, some other teams maybe you didn't expect. But 
Uh, I think it's still early. The other thing I also point out, I know I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but second and eighth place in the Atlantic division before tonight's games, which we're recording on Thursday, were separated by six points. Like it's really tight there. So I think it's, I don't think the, the I don't think the Leafs are feeling like the world is closing in on them. Even though a lot of I've got a lot of texts from Leaf fans and family members and people on the newsletter chat being like, I'm really concerned about where this team is. So I think it's like, yeah, okay, but let's let's wait. I remember similar kind of angsty feelings early last year, and I yeah. actually was of, I was of the mind that I felt they needed more adversity this year than they've had in previous years if they were actually really going to do something meaningful this season. So maybe this is it. Oh, it's, it's what Willie said yesterday, right? After the yeah, game. Yeah, I think he yeah. believes it. I actually do think he believes it because he never really talks that way. Like he yeah. usually just talks about playing better and and that they'll, they'll figure it out. And um, I, I really do think that he actually does believe that, um, that, that maybe they need to kind of be put through more stress so that they can kind of figure it out instead of, you know, the last two years outside of that little blip early in the season, how meaningless were those, those like second half of the seasons where you kind of knew where the Leafs were, you knew what the matchup was and you're just kind of like, eh, you're kind of waiting. Yeah. Let this be good, positive stress for them. So let's see what happens. But like, when you look at, I mean, Sheldon Keith, one other uh, comment from the game with the centers was kind of talking about getting the group to kind of come together for each other. He felt like there was that disconnect with the group. Do you, do you get that sense? Like, do you agree with Sheldon on like that sentiment that the group doesn't feel as connected in the way he wants them to be? I think there could be a little bit of it on the ice for sure. I don't know outside of that. Like it, it seems like guys have been getting along. Like, um, like I just look at the bot, like when I watch warm up, I'm looking for body language and seeing if, you know, heads are down or if they're just kind of, there's no energy or anything but they, they seem to be pretty up like Ryan Reeves and Mitch Marner are, are constantly doing these things with each other during warm up now. Like they were wearing each other's buckets on the road. They, they have this thing where they go up along the boards and do the shoulder bump with each other. And like, that's, that's loud guy newcomer with, with uh, old guard in, in Marner. Right. Like I, I don't really see that part where there's not that kind of playing for each other. I mean, the only thing where it was really, where this really started to get talked about was the fact that Timothy Lilligren went down in Boston and no mm. one kind of did anything about it. And then everyone kind of looked at Ryan Reeves because they're like, hello, like, this is your thing. And so, so nothing kind of happened there and they said it's going to change. And so that goes from the angst of that to not playing well defensively and all this other stuff that I think... Sheldon Keefe never used to be concerned about it, but I think he's also of the mind that, you know, some of this stuff on the ice is spilling it over. And some of the stuff I mentioned with Giordano, where the system is supposed to allow for mistakes where you support each other on the ice and move into those spots. And it's just not happening with the same fluidity. And I think he's more upset about that than anything else right now, because under his system, which he has shown has worked before when it's not working, that's what gets him the most frustrated because he knows he's put out something that works. And as long as they, they do what they're supposed to and support each other, when guys get out of position, everything's going to be fine. And that just hasn't happened. And I think that's more of what he's talking about as opposed to kind of what's happening in the room and things like that. I got one more general for you, and then we'll kind of move on and, and tee up these games this weekend. Um, Who's exceeded expectations more, do you think, this year? The fact that Tavares and Nylander have actually connected and worked this year after a couple of years of not really working out, or Matthew Nyes, like which which of those two have been a nice surprise for you? I think Nylander Tavares would probably be number one only because the Nyes, the Nyes uh, mix there with with Nylander, or sorry, with uh, Matthews and Marner has been so short-lived, and he's had two great games in that role. That first line was not particularly great last night. And uh, since talking about body language, I may as well say it. When we were in the room, you know, when the room opens, a lot of guys are not usually there. But even after yeah. practice, I, 
I noticed Nyes was just kind of in deep thought. And since this is a video show and we can describe it in audio as well, but like he was just kind of like staring down at a spot at his stall, like which I, I'd not really seen him do before. And so I don't know, like he was still on his line. Everything was fine at practice, but we came in and he was just kind of in some sort of zone where he just wasn't like the same, where he's just kind of in up, good up spirits talking and being jovial stuff could have just been a bad day could be reading yeah. too much into it but um there there is that where william nylander has just been automatic like i mean you can't argue with a point streak uh certainly he's a man on a mission being in a contract year and uh saying and doing all the right things that line was really good uh again last like uh for the last little while so i think I think you can really only go with that. The fact that Nylander has been consistent and there hasn't been that dip yet is good. Unfortunately, the Leafs are 6-5-2, and two, and so they have more losses and wins in that regard. And so that's generally what the, the team will be judged on. But um, in Nylander's case, I think he's been the biggest surprise because he's just looked solid and the types of plays that he's made have have just worked out well. And I think... Tavares has kind of elevated his game along with it and and they've made it work with no matter whom they've got. They've got Tyler Bertuzzi there now, but you know, they mix it around quite a bit earlier on this season. Well, we'll uh take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll get into the games this weekend. Got Calgary and Vancouver coming to town. So we'll tee those up in just a moment. Uh, but first we'll tell you about one of our show sponsors today. Today's show is also brought to you by Jace Medical. Whether you're ext on extended travel, bracing for a major weather event, or limited by yet another supply shortage, you are covered, my friend. Thanks to our partners at Jace Medical, life-saving antibiotics and a long list of daily medications can be ordered in a one-year supply. Even ED generics for Cialis, Viagra, and Rivadio prescriptions. Go online right now at jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on, of your daily medication. Remember to use promo code locked on at checkout for a discount as well. A verified customer had this to say about Jace. I am thankful for this service. Supply chain issues caused me to cut pills in half just to get enough for what I needed. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. I also ordered an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies. I highly recommend this for everyone. If you're someone or someone you love is looking for peace of mind by having a year supply of daily med, go to jacemedical.com to see if it's offered for you. Remember to use promo code locked on for $20 off your purchase. That is J A S E medical.com. Welcome back into the locked on at leaves podcast. It's Mike DeStefano with Dave Morissuti. We've got David Alter of SI and the hockey news uh, joining us today. Um, Let's break down these these games this week, and we'll start at the game tonight. Toronto, they got Calgary coming to town. Uh, they, yeah, it's been a tough go for Calgary, honestly. I, I find it interesting. Uh, I think most expected for them to have a bounce back with Sutter departing from the team hasn't quite been uh, the case. Like, nothing's changed. Like, uh, Huberto still has been terrible and is getting benched, and you got Kadri still not scoring goals, and, and Markstrom still bad. Like, are you surprised by how much Calgary has struggled out of the gate? I'm not. I mean, the problem, too, is when Calgary built their team, and I like the way they built it in in the midst of what they were kind of dealing with in the summer of 2022. But, I mean, they kind of felt hamstrung to lock in Huberto long-term, which they did. Uh, a lot of signing bonus money, and it's hard not to get comfortable with that. Like they're really, what's the edge? There's no edge there. Nazem Kadri signed late in the summer, that deal after what looked like he was kind of going around and figuring things out. And then eventually ended up signing a deal with the team that he initially said no to when the Leafs tried to trade him uh, as part of his no trade list. And so uh, you've got some other pieces and there are some other good pieces there, but I mean, I don't see the fire in that team, no pun intended. Like, uh, I just don't see, I don't see a team that's really pushing to kind of do something here. And they've had so much turnover and a new voice and 
and all their new are all their new voices are internal voices like from their yeah. gm to their their head coach so i don't know i mean it looked like maybe not enough change happened after last season that they should have done a little bit more uh, and um yeah i mean though that's a core that's going to just get older at this point so yeah. i don't feel great about their prospects which is why there's so much talk about could the Leafs get Zadorov or, or anybody else from there? Because at some point, Calgary's going to have to start looking at, are we too mid that we have to start bottoming out? Because yeah. if these guys don't turn it up soon, that's going to be the conversation, especially come spring. Yeah, Chris Tan is an interesting name. Toronto native, yeah. defensive defenseman, right? Like that, that that's the type of guy, and True Living brought him to Calgary. That's the type of guy who I wouldn't mind Toronto sniffing in at if... Uh, if they do end up kind of opening what goes lines. back. That's the, that's the other thing too. There's talk of yeah. like the Leafs trying to do something via trade to uh, improve their defense. So they're always, you know, like you always see the, the reports that tree living is always talking, right? But the cap, the cap well, right now is just, it's so immovable that teams are so bunched in that like, unless you know. a team has already decided they're selling, I don't know what else you can do. That's true. That's true. Well, I mean, if Calgary, if, if they're selling at that point, like the cap doesn't matter, I guess. But no, you know, I, I did look at Klingberg's deal and just in my head. I'm thinking, OK, could, could they move off this? Like, could they just cut their losses and try and move out of this? I don't know if it would take a sweetener, what it would take to, to, to make it go away. But half of that deal was a signing bonus. So there's not a whole lot of money left to be paid out for teams right. who, you know, may consider taking on that contract and see if they could maybe if they could get him to do something and then flip him at the deadline for you know third round pick potentially uh if if that he could you know turn his game around if not i don't know but maybe you get a sweetener for taking that contract potentially but yeah. that was one way where i'm like hey here's how the here's the only real way the, the leafs can open up cap space they got to move one of those guys yeah. So, yeah. but I, I still, I'm still of the belief that they're going to do their best to make Klingberg work still. Yeah. Like, I think that's why all indications are that he's going to be the seventh defenseman instead of just being scratched. The other thing we were thinking about as a possibility was if he was scratched, it was just going to be a message for the back to back that it's just one game to fresh, like to, to just see things from up top and just maybe get a bit of a different perspective. But then you're automatically going back. But then the risk there is if the team, looks so great and then you have to make that change because you promised it then what are you doing so um it's tough that it's, like, a... that, it, it's happened before like that happened last year with justin hall where he ended up sitting yep. out like three or four games at, at, right where it's like you know this guy was technically a top four guy but struggles for a couple of weeks so they give him one night in the press box but then they start winning and they're defending and it's like well they're kind of playing better without him. Next thing you know, he's missed four games. Now, ultimately, he got his job back, and he came back in, and he played fine. But, like, there's precedence for that happening, and I don't know. The, the number three must be cursed because the last <laughs> last in Detroit. Few, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> he's doing perfectly fine over in Detroit, yeah, but that, uh, here in it's Toronto. It's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes the moment the, a player leaves Toronto. I know. I know. You know. Dave, go ahead. What do you think about the goaltending situation with Joseph Wall and Samsov splitting the back to back? I know Wall wasn't coming is not coming off his finest start, but you know, take onus for you know the one Mia Copa after he stepped in when the team desperately needed someone to make some saves for them. So I asked Sheldon Keith this because after that performance in Wall, I thought, okay, maybe we might see Samsonov again. Like I thought maybe. Um, because it, it seemed, even though we never asked this, it seemed like the Leafs were kind of in this win and you're in kind of rotation. It seemed because yeah. like there were a lot of these losses. Then wall wins after, after taking over for Samsonov gets to start again. It, it, it seemed like that. It didn't seem like there was much of a plan. It, it seemed like it went from 67% Samsonov to start the season, which made sense to Samson off struggles in Tampa ride wall for a little bit and do two and flip it, do two and one that way. Then they were doing one and one. And then I asked Sheldon Keefe today, like, what's your feel? Like, how are you, how are you doing the goaltending right now? Like with, with everything that's going on. And he's like, well, 
Wall's going to get the net and like we feel like Wall can bounce back or whatever. And he's in that situation where we feel comfortable with him doing that. Where with Samsonov, we feel he needs more time, needs another day. And uh, Samsonov was requested to speak today and declined. And he's what usually is, pretty, it? he's pretty open to talk. So, yeah. so like there's definitely like Samsonov didn't seem happy about stuff that's going on right now. I don't know if it's at the decision or if at his play in general, like I'm not, I'm not accusing or, or whatever, but well, what, does that, what does that mean um, though? It's like he, he needs another day, another day for what? To, like, to just, they don't feel they're in a situation with him right now where they feel they can throw him in because of what transpired at the last game. Like they, yeah. Like, like when I remember the reaction, like just seeing him slam his mask, I was just mm -hmm. like, oh boy, like this is this, this could be a guy who's broken. And then the other thing too was uh, before morning skate for the last game, Samsonov was out there early with Nick Antropov and, uh, and Shane Doan, who's actually been taking the ice doing uh, a lot of the goalie ice and Shane Doan looks amazing on the ice, by the way. Uh, like um, it's just incredible, like how he's skating backwards before taking these shots around the bag of pucks. Anyway, uh, at 47, he looked pretty good out there. But, um, yeah, it's just it's, it's weird. It's weird to see how much time they're spending with him because I think they're in a situation where they're worried that uh, this could come apart, where with Wall, they're, they feel more comfortable. But Samsonov is going to get the net against a pretty good Vancouver team right now. Yeah. But that's the, that's the second game of a back-to-back -back that usually throw – to your backup goalie that you don't think you have a chance at. And I think that speaks volumes as to where the goaltending situation is right now. Well, and it's the yeah. better one too. Like you think sometimes I know that coaches generally will try to give the starter the easier game in some cases, but at the same time, Keith you want to get flip flopped on this though. Like he, yeah, he, I don't think he has it like Babcock. It was my starters playing night one. My backups yeah. playing night two. Keith has kind of, flip-flopped on it i don't know if there's been a like i don't know if i read into wall getting night one and and samson getting night two as oh they have more confidence in wall i i don't either but what he said leading up to the decision of both goalies yeah was to me more telling about the right. state of goaltending right now where with samsonov i think it's going to be very limited because i think there there's some fragility there where and they're they're really weary of it so with Wall, there was – if Samsonov didn't – it's not even that he got pulled. If he didn't melt down like he did on the bench after yeah. that, I think they would have been fine with going back with him after Wall's performance. But if but, you're looking to get get this guy back, like get his confidence back, get him in a good state of mind, putting him against Calgary, a much easier opponent as opposed to the league's leading goal scoring team in the Vancouver Canucks seems a bit of an odd move. Here's what I'll say about that, Mike, though. That's 100% correct if goaltending was the only issue. But because of the yeah. defense and some of the other things, too, it's not like last year where the goaltending was like, uh, we need someone to step up because everything else is kind of okay. There's yeah. a lot going on, and the goaltending is just kind of compounding into it. It's almost to the point where I wonder, you know, the goaltending needs to be better, but the goaltending is kind of part and parcel with what's happening with the rest of the team right now uh, on yeah. the back end. So oh, I'm with I, you. I look I'm, at I, I look at that, and it's it's about what's going to get them the result mm -hmm. of these next two, as opposed to where my where my goalie can build confidence because. The defense needs to be better, and the defense needs confidence, as we've already established, too. So yeah. that's that's the big variable that throws that out the window, in my opinion. Only thing I want to add to that is also people had the same sentiment when he was named the starter in Boston, and he had one of his better games in yeah. Boston. I was surprised at that one. I, I was surprised that he got that start in Boston, but then the rationale made sense, too, because, look, Joseph Walls, NHL career is very limited and yeah. we don't know how he's going to be. And the one thing I think we both can agree on right now is that the Leafs are going to need two goaltenders this season to, to yep. really kind of tandem it out because neither have the track record. Uh, they, they could call someone up, but that's a whole other thing, but they, they need, they need both guys and they can't just like, oh, you're having a bad game. I'm you know, throwing you under the bus. 
Like they really need to work with these guys because they just don't have any other choice. Maybe sniff around on Markstrom. I thought Calgary just brought up Dustin Wolf. Is Markstrom just, on the block? Just, just <laughs> Toronto should just take all of uh, Calgary's best players and that's just it. take and them all. All the underachieving guys. Yeah, yeah, just come yeah. To Toronto, exactly. Yeah, exactly. why not? Just Follow build Tree, Tree Living Two Point so, Exactly. So there's that, but uh, I don't know. It's it's interesting. But look, my prediction for the Leafs was that they were going to finish with fewer points this season and still finish first. But that was under the guise that Boston was going to slip. I didn't think Boston was going to do what they did. And shame on me because I've been fooled once already with what they did last year. So, so you as well. Yeah. So, so they're right back there and really they're way ahead of everybody else in that division that it looks like it's almost, I hate this joke that it's locked up for Boston in the division, but it's looking that way with how tight two through eight is right now in the Atlantic division. So Yeah. yeah, but like, look, I'm fine. If you're a Leaf fan, I think them getting a wild card spot and learning some things is the best thing that could happen to this group. Because think about it. If you're a Leaf fan, aren't you kind of sick of the same old, yeah, they got 105 points. Yeah, they've got offense. Yeah, the defense kind of looks good. But what happens when the goal, like, like, was there any point this season where it looked like the going got tough and they really kind of had to, to deal with some real, I don't know if I could swear on this, but like, you know, like real shit. Like, yeah. have they really had to deal with anything? Like in the last few years, they really didn't. They struggled for like three or four games in a row. It was so early. It was on the road. And then it came back and everything was fine. And then you really didn't even think about it again. Let right. them like, and, and the issues that you you did have were small. Oh, Nylander like has like a small blip toward the end of the year. Well, yeah, there wasn't really much to play for. It's easy to kind of get settled in. You're waiting for good stress. Like I, I, in my preseason predictions, I had Boston losing in the first round to Florida. I got ridiculed for it. But what happens is when teams kind of run away with it early in the season, they don't have positive stress to kind of deal with. And look, the Leafs got through the first round. That's great. But they actually were a terrible team in that series yeah. against Tampa. They were. They got the goaltending that won them the series. And karma kind of blessed them for the first time after they were the better team in 2022 and didn't get the job done. So I think it's good for the Leafs to just go through some real shit and figure themselves out so that they can hold each other to account and that I think is better for them in the long run because people are going to freak out about this now, but like it's game 13, like, and, and, and look where they are in two through eight in the division. It's so wide open. It's so early. Let them figure out their shit. And then if it's a real problem where they look like they're on the outside looking in, like after U S Thanksgiving and they're well out of a playoff spot. Okay. Then freak out. I get it. But right now it's, you know, I think it's good for them to kind of go through this. And William Nylander, I think his comments are probably the most level-headed of, of anything because I 100% agree with them about this, that they need some real adversity for a change. And let's be real, outside of the playoffs, when the playoffs have come, they've not really had it in the regular season. They just haven't. No, but the playoffs, it really ramps up there. and it helps. Right, but let them I'm learn really this fun. stuff now, right? Like, look, no, at, look, I'm, how, I'm, I agree. Look, yeah. look at what, like, I know with Florida, it's always a bad example, but look at what Florida went through in the regular season. They look like a disaster. There's so many teams that look like a disaster, and as long as they get it together after the trade deadline, I always tell people when I make my playoff predictions, I only look at the trade deadline on. Because everything before that, there's so many variables. New guys come in and out with buying and selling. You do not know your team until the trade deadline onwards. That is the fact. And you can even see it with how teams play then and how it translates into success in the postseason. The teams that play the best after that generally are the ones that are winning playoff rounds in, in the playoffs. And that's, that's really what the Leafs should be focused on is let them figure out their stuff. So basically, we need Ty Domi to go on like Ottawa radio and rip the Leafs for being soft, and then they'll go on a cup run, right? Yeah, whatever, whatever happens. Like, I just think <laughs> you know that whole coming together as a team and all that stuff that Sheldon keeps talking about, even if it's on defensively. I think he's sick of it too. I think he just yeah, wants to sure. see. Yeah, I think he just wants to see it mean something, make it mean something. Like I, that's I mean really what it's about. We've been talking about this for a, a, a couple of shows now and a few shows now where it's like 
I, I don't know if if the pieces that Sheldon Keefe was given this offseason necessarily fit what Sheldon Keefe wants to do, and that's why they've really struggled. Like, the last couple of years, he's been able to throw his third and fourth line in the D zone, and they've been reliable, right? Regardless yeah. if it was Engvall, Zach Aston Reese, uh, whoever it may have been, this year that's not the case. They're getting eaten alive. Like, wh- whoever, yeah. like Domi, Reeves, Camp has been very poor as well. Um, it's been, it's you could been argue a, a, that's, a you could goal. argue that's a symptom of who he's playing with too. You could, like there, you could. there, there is some of that. Like he's um, got to but, overcompensate and that's kind of putting yeah. him at a position, right? Like it's at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's five, it's a five man unit. And when you're outscored, it's an eight to nothing. The fourth line right now, like that wasn't the case last year, the fourth line, they, they could go out last season and, and grind and often turn it into some offense and put some pressure, uh, you know, with Zach Ass and Reese and, and Lafferty, like they kind of got something going. I, uh, it hasn't been the same. And, and I, you know, I'm hoping Keith can figure it out. I don't know if he, if he has to adapt or if they need to cut bait and just kind of get some other people in here that can do that type of job. Um, that's, I mean, outside of Klingberg struggles, no one was arguing about their, I mean, uh, and Reeves, okay. Reeves too. But it's outside of those two, no one was really questioning if these guys can play in the league, really. So, like, yeah. it's on him to figure it out and make it work. And that might make him a better coach, too. Because you can't yeah. just be like, I need guys who fit my thing, otherwise that's it. Like, True. you know, go, get into the fourth dimension of your brain a little bit. It might be a challenge. It might be tough. But this is going to test him as a coach. And I think, like, it's that's why I argue this is a good thing for them to kind of go through. I looked at the moves that they made and I was like, listen, uh, I mean, the Reeves fine. People freak out about that, but it's a $200,000 cap hit. If it doesn't work, that's a quarter of a player. For three like years. It's just, but 200,000 on the books. If you, if you fire him into the sun and you figure out and you bury him, it's $200,000 on your cap. That's it. 1.15 million is buriedable. Like it's variable. So, so 200,000 on your cap is, is insignificant, especially with the way the cap is going to go up. So now, going it's, forward, it's a, yeah. quor- it's a quarter of the minimum NHL salary. It's a little over a quarter of the NHL minimum salary. That's how much would be on the books. That's why the Leafs made this deal because they said, look, if it doesn't work out, is it worth the $200,000 cap hit risk? I would argue. Yes. People are freaking out because he's in there and whatever in the year and stuff. It's so easy to bury. It's not John Klingberg that you can't bury. It's not Jack Campbell that you can't bury. Like, it's not those things. It's small. The other stuff, the other stuff, I think no one would have argued that Tyler Bertuzzi was a different kind of guy that the Maple Leafs needed in the summer. And, you know, it's slow for him, but I'm not ready to throw the book on him yet. Like, I think he could still kind of work out. And, and last figure, couple of games, it seemed like it seemed like yeah. he's kind of got a little bit more pep in his step. Last couple, of yeah. Years. No, I I love that move that led to his goal, like getting yeah. out from underneath to to do it. That's exactly what they got him for a different a different kind of guy who can kind of fit there, and that that looks like a great top six fit for him. So there's that, and then I I think Max Domi on that third line now at center, that's probably where he should be. I like Nick Robertson on that wing and Kelly Yarncroke is just automatic when it comes to the defensive responsibilities there. So all that combined, I don't think it's as bad for the Leafs right now as people are, are, are ready to kind of mail in. I think people are just accustomed to this 100 point Maple Leafs season. And I don't think that's, I think Leafs should welcome something different where they go through some real issues and stress to kind of, hold each other accountable to be a better team than they've been in previous years. One that will actually hold themselves to account in the playoffs and be very different. And that's why I don't think that what's going on right now is that bad for the Maple Leafs. I'll say this, Boston didn't face a lick of adversity really last year. And look what it may have, look what happened to them in the first round against Florida. Right. Wow. But that's it, oh, no, but it, but it happens. There. It, on, it happens on. though. They did face adversity. The problem is with Boston, and they're facing adversity right now. The right. problem is with Boston is they always go through it that you don't even notice. Marshawn missed the first, like, three months of the year. McAvoy missed the first, like, two months. They had a bunch of dudes who right. were out, and dudes had to step up. 
what happened last week, Mar- Marsha or uh, McAvoy's out, Grizzly was out, and then another def- uh, Derek Forbert was out last Forbert week. Was out what, as well, what happened? Yeah. They threw out dudes like Mason Lori, who came out and looked better than any of the other Leafs defensemen who were out there in his they, first they've NHL got depth. game. They've got they, depth. They they've got, got it. They've got a culture forward. and they've got all this other stuff. But that's built up over years, right? Like that's yeah. built up over years with the same core guys that have just passed that down. Posternak's passed it down like long after, and and that's yeah. just the way they're going to be. But what what I but what Dave's talking about too is the fact that it wasn't results adversity where they're actually starting to kind of have this existential crisis about themselves. Yeah, My, like that was that's, kind of the point. like getting yeah. 120 something points. Hasn't really worked out for a lot of teams. Like, it hasn't worked out for any president's trophy winning team in the last five years. The last five winners have lost three consecutive playoff games in a row on route to elimination in the first or second round. And that's because they didn't have, they didn't know what their team was capable of when times got tough. There was just no, there was nothing to measure it against. And so yeah. So, I even see Carolina is a bigger symptom of that. Like Carolina's yeah. had guys go down, but at the same point, they still find a way to get through it in the regular season. But in the playoffs, that's where it gets tested to a whole other level. Yeah, it's different. I just think, I think, I think teams going through a real, like we need to like, you know, players only meeting type stuff, like where that, that actually happens is good for the team. To make and, my and like, better, look at what Vegas went through last year. Like Jack Eichel was being called out by his coach. Basically, people were saying, ah, Jack Eichel in Vegas wasn't really working out well. They went on to win the cup and like look unstoppable. Yeah, like, that's I, just, I, think, I think there there needs to be some good positive stress for the Leafs, and there just hasn't been good there hasn't been enough of it. There's been and like look, I, I've been to every game the last two years or whatever, and like I go and it's like, oh, okay, just get to the playoffs already because you know, they're, they're just going to do this and get yeah. the results, but no one cares. Like get to, get to where the games matter, like have something like, I would love to hear that someone like shove the locker room, not the stalls don't move, but like, you know, someone messed up their stall because they were so angry or whatever. And it really got people like, well, out of their comfort zone a little bit. I think they're too comfortable. Like let, let's, let's see how this plays out with calling the stars out. You know, even Mitch Marner was kind of saying, oh, it's you media or whatever. It's like, you know what? Start start having a thing within yourself and let's see what happens. Because I think that's where, where things like that need to kind of change and we'll see. Like, I think some real attitude shifting will happen if, if they go on some, uh, like a real slide or there's a real panic of perhaps missing the playoffs. But the Leafs yeah. are not there yet. They, they no. really aren't. That's why I think it's too early to panic about this stuff. Yeah, it is. And they always say, wait until at least American Thanksgiving. And I mean, it, it is only two weeks away. Like the, the year's it's a gone wide open division. Quick. That's actually what's but, helping and hurting the Leafs right now. Yeah. Is yeah. the fact that it's like, like, I mean, Boston's far up ahead, but like they're a Everyone couple points away from right second. Like, yeah. Ottawa's but then they're, last, I think, in the division, like they're not, they're not out of it by any stretch. Of the they're one point back at Toronto now. So there you go. Yeah. It's, uh, like, it's it's uh i love it i love that there's an actual race for the other spots in the division for a change that's actually fun to see and i think that'll be good for toronto because games the games need to have weight and unfortunately for the leafs just given the way the structure has been they're good regular season team but once they got to mid-november the games didn't really take on much significance given where they were in the standings yeah they still had to play well and they did that's credit to them. They have to do what they have to do, but the circumstances don't allow for positive stress to really challenge themselves to be a better team for when the going gets tough. Uh, Dave, we really appreciate taking the time to, uh, to join us today. Um, why don't you tell us uh, and, and the listeners quickly though, about the newsletter that you're doing this year? Yeah. So uh, I decided to open up a little Substack newsletter about you know, we, uh, we do this like as a business, like, uh, Mike, you're doing it with the hockey news as well for the collectible side. But, um, I've been doing this as a business for a little while. So I kind of wanted to take people on a bit of a peek behind the curtain as to what it entails, how I book travel, how I, 
how I managed to get my 22 taxes down as low as I did for costs uh, by being able to travel by really just points hacking and a lot of other stuff that I think people can use in their everyday lives, but also chat with people when I'm on the road about things that happen on the road uh, or that, that can happen within a game for live chats on a sub stack. So um, it's the road dot biz um, is the website for it. And yeah, uh, you can sign up free. There's a paid subscription where we do chats, but um, I'm happy to share a lot of the secrets because I think no matter what kind of line of work you're in, especially if you're an entrepreneur, uh, there's some things I've learned in the last few years that I think can really help your bottom bottom dollars. So uh, your bottom line, I should say. So uh, I'm really excited about it because I geek out about this stuff away from the Leafs, but I incorporate the leaf stuff too. The road dot biz. The road dot is go check it out guys. Uh, definitely an intriguing read for sure. Uh, that'll do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You'd subscribe to the locked on lease podcast, wherever you get your podcast from also up on YouTube, you'll receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on uh, X at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti and also follow uh, David Alter at D Alter on Twitter. Uh, go ahead. If you enjoy this video, leave a like, a little comment down below. And uh, we'll be back with another episode for y'all on Monday. Enjoy the games this weekend. Go Leafs go and keep it locked right here on Locked on Leafs.